So uh, what I was going to do is just to read a little bit, um, probably about 10, 10 or so minutes, um, and then you're the one you'll be moderating the questions. Is that right? Yep, I'm just I'm going to do an introduction. So okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you. And welcome to the third meeting of the Philip Roth Book Club. My name is Nadine, and I'm the supervising librarian of the Philip Roth Personal Library at the Newark Public Library. I'm so happy you could join us today for an insightful conversation with Matthew Scheip, Senior Lecturer and Director of Advanced Writing in the English Department at Washington University in St. Louis. He is the author of Understanding Philip Roth, which was published by the University of South Carolina Press this spring. He is the president of the Philip Roth Society and serves on the executive board of the John Updike Society. Please note that at any time you can type your question into the chat box or into the Q&A and we'll address those in the Q&A part of the discussion. Please post your, your question so that all panelists and participants in the meeting can see your question. And here we are. I would like you to in, would like to introduce you to Matthew Scheip. Hey, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really excited about this. Um, the Counter Life is one of my favorite Roth novels. Um, uh, so I was really pleased to be able to talk about it this this afternoon. It's a really important book for Roth. Um, uh, it comes out in 1986, um, and it really kickstarts the critical acclaim that uh, distinguishes the second half of Roth's career. So it's a book that really propels uh, his, his critical reputation uh, really from here into the early 2000s, really starts that great run of novels that continues with the American trilogy, uh, Sabbath Theater, and of course, The Plot Against America. So it's really, a, it's, a, it's a book of, of renewal for Roth in terms of his critical reception, uh, but also of his powers. It's a wonderful sort of uh, display of what all that Roth can do. Um, it's a formerly, formerly uh, it's a formerly sort of um, um, difficult and interesting book. Uh, the chapters, the five chapters, of course, contradict each other. There's a great sense of play here. So there's a sort of postmodern sense of experiment going on throughout the, throughout the counter life. But that's weighed against or balanced out by this kind of wonderful sense of realism that I think distinguishes the writing here. I mean, Roth is always a sort of wonderfully particular realist, um, um, but it really shines through in the counter life, the sections in Israel and in England. Um, so in many ways, it's, it's, it's both his most experimental book in some ways, but also um, one that is it is sort of shows off his skills and uh, as, as a realist. Uh, it's also a book very important for some of the key sort of notions uh, that that appear throughout Ross Ross work. Um, uh, one, of course, is the sense of Jewishness, but beyond that, just the sense of identity, this uh, embracing this sort of performative nature of identity. Um, and that's something I like to focus a little bit on in my uh, remarks today. Uh, also, the sort of relationship between self and place, too. The, the five sections of the book, of course, devoted to different places. And the book is interested in how our sense of self is, is altered by where we are in the world. Um, and so in that sense, it's, that's quite important, too. Uh, but it's also a book deeply invested in the, the the power of fiction, the meaning of fiction, and what fiction can do, the ethics of, of fiction writing, um, uh, the sort of questions about what fiction's capable of doing is something that I think carries Roth through the second half of his career. Uh, again, we see the sort of uh, sort of questions about about the sort of necessity of fiction um, carry on throughout the American trilogy. If, you, if you're familiar with those with those novels, um, but uh, also. The ethics of fiction, the, the, the section with, uh, with especially with Henry uh, after Zuckerman dies, uh, his brother Henry uh, discovering the manuscript and really, really questioning the sort of ethics of what it means to take the raw materials of life and transform it sometimes very thinly in, into fiction. So it's Roth really considering those questions, uh, I think, in a kind of wonderfully, wonderfully playful way. Uh, so what I'd like to do this morning um, is read a little bit. Uh, I have to apologize. I'm going to be shameless. I'm going to read from my just published book, Understanding Philip Roth. Um, uh, I'm going to read just a very brief. Uh, there's a chapter devoted to the early uh, uh, Zuckerman novels. It, it starts with The Ghost Rider, which I, I believe uh, was the first or second book uh, discussed in the, in the book club. Uh, talks about um, the, the, that first Zuckerman trilogy um, and then the counter life and exit ghost. But what I like to do is just read a little bit from the beginning of the chapter for those of you who aren't as familiar with the Zuckerman series to give a little sense of context uh, and then read just the, the, the pages devoted to the, to, the, to the counter life as a way of maybe um, 
contextualizing the book uh, and giving a sense of some of the questions that we might talk about uh, talk about today. Uh, if there is one regret with the book itself, is that the section on the counter life isn't long enough. Um, for me, uh, if I'm ranking the Roth novels, and uh, I don't know if that's a great exercise or not, it's it's in my top three or four, uh, along with American Pastoral and Sabbath Theater. Um, and the Ghost Rider. Uh, these are the books that I think are are, are, are Ross most most important. But in many ways, the current life is the sort of key moment in his career where his Roth describes an interview as a very expansive novel uh, and it's really it is him really stretching himself in terms of the form of the novel what the novel can do uh, not only in terms of the, the sort of questions and the geographical range of, of, of the book but also in terms of thinking about again the sort of uh, capacity of fiction it's a, it's a really important book for Roth so uh, I'm going to read a little bit uh, and and then uh, we'll turn things over for conversation so so again, I'm going to read a little bit from the very beginning of the chapter for those of you who aren't as familiar with the Zuckerman series uh, to sort of get a sense of where the current life fits in and how we understand Zuckerman as a character, as a sort of alter ego for, for Roth. Um, and then read the section devoted to the, to the, to the counter life, which again, I, 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 I wish the section in this book were, were longer. If I had an expanded edition, uh, that's what I would do. So, um, so. In the concluding section of Ross's 1988 autobiography, The Facts, Nathan Zuckerman, the fictional writer whose life and career Roth chronicled for over 30 years, responds to his creator's decision to abandon fiction for the seemingly more transparent form of autobiography. Quote, I owe everything to you, while you, however, owe me nothing less than the freedom to write freely. I am your permission, your indiscretion, the key to disclosure. I understand that now as I never did before, end quote. While charmingly self-serving, Zuckerman's argument for his necessity more broadly suggests the character's importance to Ross's most successful fiction. Starting with My Life as a Man, uh, which was published in 1975, um, where he debuted as the invention of that novel's writer protagonist, Peter Tarnable, Nathan Zuckerman would appear either as the protagonist or the narrator of nine more books. And The Counter Life is kind of right in the middle of this, this, this kind of series or sequence that, that star, stars Zuckerman. On Zuckerman's appeal, Roth observed in his 1984 Paris Review interview with Hermione Lee, quote, Zuckerman has two dominant modes, modes his mode of self abnegation and his fuck a mode. You want a bad Jewish boy, that's what you're going to get. He rests from one by taking up the other, though, as we see, it's not much of a rest. The thing about Zuckerman that interests me is that everybody split, but few so openly as this, end quote. And that sense of a divide that Roth describes in that 84 interview, um, I think nicely anticipates what he does with the character in, in The Counter Life. The division appears most apparent in the first four Zuckerman books, The Ghost Rider, which y'all, y'all I think discussed, Zuckerman Unbound, The Anatomy Lesson, The Prague Orgy, a sequence that Roth published in one volume in 1985 as Zuckerman Bound. The course of that series, Roth traces the major events of the protagonist's professional career, from the innocent young writer presented in The Ghost Rider to the exhausted and pain-wracked middle-aged man captured in The Anatomy Lesson and The Prague Orgy. Quote, a writer learns to stay around, has to, in order to make sense of, uh, of incurable life, in order to chart the turnings of the punishing unknown, even when there's no sense to be made, Roth writes in The Anatomy Lesson, as Zuckerman experiences a midlife crisis of sorts. Roth returns to the character the year after the publication of the Prague Orgy and the Mind Bending the Counter Life, again published in 86, his most potent examination of the interrelationship between narrative and identity. In the American trilogy, American Pastoral, American Communist, and He Must Stay, all of which come out in the late, late 1990s, Zuckerman moves beyond imagining himself and considers the lives of other men, and more broadly, the trajectory of the United States in the decades following the Second World War. After employing Zuckerman as the narrative imagination behind the American trilogy, Roth would revisit, revisit the character one final time in 2007's Exit Ghost, depicting uh, Zuckerman re-entering public life after more than a decade of living in seclusion. Uh, this chapter I'm reading from uh, focuses on Zuckerman Bound, The Counter Life and Exit Ghost. Um, over the course of these books, Zuckerman Roth gives Zuckerman much of his own biography and career tra trajectory, uh, an idyllic uh, childhood in Newark, leaving that beloved home for college, a brief stint in the army, graduate work at the University of Chicago, early success publishing fi fiction that scandalizes the Jewish American community, a sexually explicit bestseller called Karnofsky and, and, and Zuckerman instead of Portnoy's that res results in celebrity. Uh, celebrity and notoriety. 
The differences between Zuckerman and Roth are subtle, uh, but worth noting. Zuckerman has a younger brother, Henry, and of course, Henry he plays a large part in the counter life, who struggles with his other brother's penchant for cannibalizing his family's life for his fiction. In rea reality, Roth had a close relationship with his older brother, Sandy, whom he had idolized during their childhood. Zuckerman's father uh, enjoys professional and financial success as a podiatrist, while Ross worked hard to carve out a stable lower middle class existence as an insurance broker. Uh, Zuckerman's father recoils from the son's fiction, as, while Ross' parents were proud of his accomplishments. Zuckerman is married and divorced several times over, while Roth married, only married twice. Beyond simply playing an unsolvable game of mirrors with readers, the Zuckerman novels rigorously explore the ethical implications of the writing life, a concern at the forefront of the ghostwriter. Um, published in 1979 and dedicated to Milan Kundera, the Czech novelist whom Roth had befriended through his work as editor for Penguin's Writers from the Other Europe series, the ghostwriter launched the second half of Roth's career and marked his most substantial critical success in support noise complaint. Uh, in both form and content, the ghostwriter anticipates the more expansive novels that Roth would publish in the 1980s and 90s, but in its conclusion and pungency, it stands as one of his most substantial ach achievements. Uh, the novel reintroduces Nathan Zuckerman again, who was first introduced as a character uh, of, of, of a character in my life as a man. Um, uh, the Zuckerman who appears in the Ghostwriter, however, appears to be a new in incarnation of this character. Uh, Cl Claudia Roth Pierpoint observes, "Quote that the new Zuckerman in its entirety different from the maritally entrapped and often enraged figure, as he is different from Peter Tarnopol and David Kapesh and other alter ego of Ross, who have also been maritally entrapped and enraged, just like Philip Roth." Ross' reclamation of Zuckerman and the Ghostwriter reflects the more flexible approach to character that he developed during the second half of his career. Unlike John Updike in, the, in his Rabbit Angstrom tetralogy, where Updike meticulously chronicles the life and times of Harry Rabbit Angstrom, Roth appears to have very little interest in constructing a definitive or consistent history for Zuckerman. Instead, the character can be better understood as a constellation of biographical circumstances, many of which he shares with his creator, and a certain narrative sensibility. But Roth, in, 2000, in, in a 2000 interview, described as, quote, the dark Zuckerman take on American life that, that animates the series. The thing I want to stress that there really is how Roth is flexible with Zuckerman's sort of life story over the course of the nine nine Zuckerman text. Um, it, there is, he, he plays with things. So there's not a sort of sense of consistency. And I think that's an important thing when thinking about the sort of experiments that Roth goes on uh, in, in the counter life, most radically killing off, of course, Zuckerman um, midway th through the book, uh, only to bring the character back. Um, uh, so there's a sort of willingness to, to play with character um, that suggests, uh, um, again, a real playful sense of what narrative can do, and how we imagine imagine the character. Um, uh, that's that I think the, the counter life is important for sort of um, signaling. I'm going to skip ahead to the section on the, the, the on the counter life. Uh, the sense of renewal surfaces fully in the counter life. Published in 1986, uh, The Counter Life remains one of Roth's most ambitious and successful novels. It won the National Book Critics Award for Fiction in 1987, initiating the run of literary prizes and critical acclaim that Roth would enjoy for the next two decades. James Wood identified The Counter Life as, quote, perhaps Roth's greatest novel, a work that takes what it needs from postmodern self consciousness and fictive games and mounts a moving inquiry into what it means to lead a life. And just to pause a second here, I think Wood really nails this in a sense of what makes, for me, The Counter Life such a, a wonderfully rich and sort of um, a rewarding read uh, and such an important book for Roth. Again, it is that marriage of of, of narrative experiments and narrative playfulness uh, with actual uh, emotion and wonderful sense of realism um, so that the game is not just a sort of um, uh, hall of mirrors, if that makes sense, but a sort of inquiry into what it means to be a self. Um, uh, what it means to be a writer, what it means to write fiction, the sort of power of fiction, the power of, of opposites, of counters. Um, so it, it is the sort of uh, that the narrative experiments combined with some real important questions and really wonderfully grounded fiction uh, and description that I think makes the counter life really one of Ross's um, 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 finest, finest moments. Reflecting on his work after retiring from fiction um, writing, Roth affirmed the counter life's importance in his career, describing it as a novel that, quote, changed everything. And this is Roth still. It was an aesthetic discovery, how to enlarge, how to amplify, how to be free. 
And again, that emphasis and amplification, I think it's the key way into reading The Counter Life. Um, it's a book that on first reading, I can, or multiple readings can be very confusing, uh, as the chapters contradict each other. Uh, um, but that sense of and, and there's this sort of wonderful moment where late in the novel, Zuckerman's talking about the power of and, 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 and that sort of that desire to amplify, um, uh, I think is key to understanding how we read, read The Counter Life. Um, coming after the condensed Zuckerman Bound series, the counter life indeed feels expansive as Roth presents a sequence of five chapters that rebuke one another, a contradictory Pentateuch uh, that explores the nexus of place, identity, and narrative. Quote, this novel to me is a book of contradictory yet mutually entangling narratives, Roth observed in a 1986 interview. I think the reader has the sensation from chapter to chapter of the rug being tugged, uh, tugged from under him. Zuckerman's English wife Maria pretty much sums things up when she says to him towards the end of the book, quote, radical change is the law of life and then adds, but you overdo it. And again, that seems like a key sort of line, line for approaching this book. Uh, indeed, The Counter Life presents a series of radical changes. In the novel's opening chapter, ba ba Basil, uh, Nathan's younger brother Henry dies in surgery, meant to correct the impotence induced from a prior bypass surgery so that he can pursue his affair with his dental assistant. In the following section, Judea, Henry is alive and well and has abandoned his family to immigrate to Israel. In the novel's fourth chapter, it is Nathan who has died from heart surgery so that he can sleep with his upstairs neighbor, an Englishman named Maria, also the name that Zucker Zuckerman gives to Henry. Henry's first mistress, who had attempted to persuade Henry to move with her to Switzerland. And in the novel's final section, Christendom, Zuckerman has been resurrected, although in the pre prior chapter we found out, find out that we could be reading the manuscript that Zuckerman was working on before dying, and is, li is living in the English countryside with Maria, whom he has married and who is now pregnant with their child. Reflecting on his brother's move to Israel, Zuckerman thinks, quote, the kind of stories that people turn life into, the kind of lives that people turn stories into, a line that signals the novel's fascination with transformation and the ways in which narrative remains a fundamental framework through which we understand ourselves and the world in which we live. Life is and, uh, Zuckerman concludes in the novel's final section, the accidental and the immutable, the elusive and the graspable, the bizarre and the predictable, the actual and the potential, all the multiplying realities, entangled, overlapping, colliding, conjoined, plus the multiplying illusions. This times this times this times this is an intelligent human being likely to be much more than a large scale manufacturer of misunderstanding. And that that line, if uh, for those of you who've read uh, uh, American Pastoral, signals something that Zuckerman says that uh, kind of is an idea that runs through Roth, uh, that getting people wrong and getting people wrong and getting people wrong is what makes us alive, what is the sort of rule of, of, of existence, that we can never fully understand each other or ourselves, uh, that, that everything is a sort of has some sort of layer of misunderstanding or misinterpretation. And this gets us to why fiction can be so valuable or useful. That fiction allows us to imagine the counter, to, to imagine the opposite, to, to play with the possibilities. Not that it gives us a sort of fuller vision of, of, of the truth, uh, but there is no, for Roth, there is no sense of that truth that we can only can grasp at it during looking at different sort of fictions with different sort of variations, playing with the possibilities. So. Um, the novel would be simply dizzying if it weren't for if it weren't not so grounded in realism, each section displaying Ross writing at its most exact. The sections set in Israel, the counter life marks for Ross for a serious engagement with the Jewish homeland is something he'll pick up again more fully in Operation Shylock, a, a, a novel that is in many ways Ross most ambitious and continues the sort of experiments of, of, of the counter life. Um, um, and England are especially impressive as they continue with the engagement with the world outside of America that Roth initiated with the Prague Orgy. And again, we see Roth really in the mid 1980s, a little bit uh, starting with the, the Prague, or, uh, sorry, with uh, the Professor Desire in 1977 and geographically expanding the realm of his fiction. And I think part of this comes from his work uh, with Penguin for the writers from other Europe series, but there's a sort of deeper engagement with, uh, with history, with the outside world that we see uh, beginning really in the in the in the late 1970s, but it takes fruition uh, for me in, 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 in the counter life. And in many ways, I think it's it, it is it's um, I, for me it's a more uh, more successful novel than Operation Shylock, which in many ways takes these sort of questions, but um, 
it, it's a bit more exhausting, I think. So uh, for me, the counter life is the perfect sort of marriage of, of again, that narrative experiments, um, the, the sort of engagement with the outside world with sort of history and these sort of questions about identity. Um, for me, it, the, the the counter life it's 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 broth at its most exact in terms of the sort of questions that he's asking beyond its playfulness beyond the ways in which the book confounds readers expectations for narrative cohesion the counter life offers roth's most robust defense of the performative nature of identity while also positing his critique of the pastoral a critique that is essential to the historical questions posed by the american trilogy and i'll pause here for me uh is these two things again um the sort of investigation into to, to identity and really embracing the sort of notion that there isn't a self, that there's no inherent solid self, that again, it's a sort of a series of impersonations, of variations, that who we are is often uh, shaped by where we are and who we're talking to, um, but th that we're always sort of performing. This for me is, is key to understanding Ross's sense of, of the self. Um, and then this notion of the pastoral and the critique of the pastoral. Um, if you remember the end of the counter life, uh, it ends with Zuckerman rejecting the sort of the, the pastoral of the womb. That, uh, and, that, and that's why the book ends on circumcision. Uh, it's a sort of way of, of, of marking the end of that sort of fantasy. But this notion of innocence, of strifeless, of a strifeless existence that Zuckerman attempts to achieve in England with his wife Maria. Um, the, you know, uh, Roth in this book is very interested in exploding that sort of sort of method. And again, we see him do this time and time again, especially in his later work, especially in the American trilogy, which is a series of novels that's all about playing with American notions of innocence and sort of ex exploding them, uh, unraveling them, showing the appeals of that of the, that fantasy and how that myth is constructed, and then also unraveling it at the at the same time. Uh, so. Um, at the end of the novel, Zuckerman tells uh, his pregnant wife, Maria, who through Zuckerman's own narrative invention has announced that she's leaving the novel, and which again is one of the sort of, when I teach this novel, it's really hard to sort of parse out, right? Uh, um, that, especially that final section uh, where it, it is uh, Zuckerman imagining Maria uh, leaving the novel. Uh, so it, it's all these sort of fine little fictive games going on throughout. Um, so this is a long quote uh, from, from Zuckerman. All I can tell you with certainty is that I, for one, have no self, and that I am unwilling and unable to perpetrate upon myself the joke of a self. It certainly does strike me as a joke about myself. What I have instead is a variety of impersonations I can do, and not only of myself, a troop of players that I've internalized, a permanent company of actors that I can call upon when a self is required, an ever-evolving stock of pieces and parts that forms my repertoire. But I certainly have no self independent of my imposturing artistic efforts to have one, nor would I want one. I'm a theater and nothing more than a theater. And again, uh, you know, that emphasis on performance, uh, on, on the theatrical, it seems really sort of central to, to Ross' notion of self throughout his career. Um, again, uh, just thinking about uh, how, how, how performance is key to how Ross imagines itself. This, this passage seems, you know, perfect for, for, for encapsulating that, that, that spirit or that notion. Zuckerman's declaration that he is a theater and nothing more seems deeply appropriate in a novel as interested in performance and the ways our identities shift when we inhabit a new place or encounter another person as the counter life is. As Deborah Shostak argues, Zuckerman's notion of the performative self remains integral to the book's examination of his Jewish identity. And this is from uh, Deborah Shostak, quote, for Roth, the contradiction gets to the heart of the problem for the American Jew, as he wrote in the notes to the book in all caps, quote, this is Roth, there's no solution to the Jewish question, continuing shows the stack. In particular, he inquires into how an American can act or be authentically Jewish, given the fluidity of that category for the diaspora Jew, whether the category is usefully delimited only by the geographical site that reverses the diasporic effect, end quote. Beyond this, Zuckerman's assertion reflects Ross' fictive approach, how he inhabits different voices. Zuckerman, Alexander Portnoy, Mickey Sabbath, David Kapesh, 
tries on different positions, embraces the contradictory feelings and ideas that permeate our existence. The capture, the counter life captures Roth's insistence on multiplicity and contradiction, the endless and exhausting ands that constitute our attempts to understand ourselves and other people. So I'll, I'll pause there. Um, uh, again, I think it's that embracing of, of contradiction that makes the book both a difficult read in some ways, or is a difficult read, uh, but it also makes it a sort of fascinating and very important book for Roth. It, it's a way in which he's able to capture and encapsulate all these contradictions into some one sort of coherent novel, even though the novel is constantly sort of contradicting, uh, contradicting itself. So uh, I can't wait to hear your questions. I can't wait to talk more about the book. So I will pass things on. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so everybody, everybody who's listening in, please go ahead and use the Q&A or the chat. And if you have any questions for Matthew, or if you have any observations or comments you would like to share with anybody else, please go ahead. And you mentioned that it's in your top four books, which would you say were like, how if you had to put the top four in order? Sure. Oh, that's that's hard. Um, and I may delete this video after. <laughs> no, um, I, I for me, American Pastoral is 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 uh, Ross kind of greatest achievement. Uh, and then after that, I would put Sabbath Theater. Um, uh, and then I, I think I have to put the Counter Life in the third position, and then the Ghost Rider, Ghost Rider fourth. Um, um, uh, the the back to back of American Pastoral and Sabbath Theater, I think displays Roth, what Roth does at, at that mid to late career point at, at its best and the ambition of those books, I think is just sort of uh, remarkable. Um, uh, the Counter Life for me is, is Roth's most important book in a sense, because it's what propels him through that second half of his career. And again, it really it critically even it reignites kind of Roth's reputation um, uh, starting in the late late 80s that really kind of continues on throughout the, that great run in the, in the 90s. Great. So we have a question from Barry. Thank you, Barry. Uh, what prior writers would you consider Roth's largest influences and how are they reflected in this one? Thanks. I think that's a really good, good, wonderful question. Um, as a starting writer, Roth was deeply interested in American literature, uh, Sinclair Lewis, um, uh, Dreiser, and we feel that effect really more in those uh, early novels, especially, uh, uh, and Henry James, of course, I should mention Henry James. Um, Henry James may be the most important influence for Roth uh, in general. Um, uh, and you feel that influence a lot in those early novels. Uh, Letting Go is such a James, uh, in, in James influenced text. Uh, when She Was Good is his sort of American naturalism books where you feel Dreiser, you feel Sinclair Lewis. Um, and when we, so when we get to The Counter Life, I think you feel a shift in, in, in influences. And for me, maybe the book's most uh, uh, most uh, pronounced influence is, is Kundera, um, uh, whose who's Roth, who's work Roth had helped bring into a sort of English English speaking audience uh, through his through his series, but that sort of sense of narrative play that you feel in unbearable lightness of being and uh, um, uh, oh, um, uh, the book of uh, book of laughter. Um, I, I think you feel that sort of experimentation that really comes from a lot of those Eastern European writers, but particularly I think Kundera. Um, uh, so I think you feel that influenced. Uh, you feel that Eastern European influence more in the counter life than you would have at, in, in the earlier in the earlier text. But great great question. Uh, next, from Roger. Roger says, I'm a Jew from Newark, born in the 1940s. Roth resonates, of course, but what is the meaning of the book to non-Jews? The book is so deeply committed to answering what is a Jew. Yeah, I think that's a you know, kind of wonderful question. And, and of course, that section in Israel is Roth really um, confronting and addressing issues of his own Jewish identity um, uh, kind of most directly. Uh, and if Roth is always, Roth, uh, throughout his career is very sort of consistent of identifying himself as an American writer. Um, uh, but the, in, the, in the current life, he's really considering the sort of questions and notions of Jewish identity. But I think he also expands these out, especially in that final section where he's talking about the performative nature of identity, the sense that there is no stable, no inherent self. Um, those sort of questions, I think, extend beyond 
uh, religious Id identity and extends a sort of greater sense of who, how, who we are, how we imagine ourselves, how we inhabit the world. And, and of course, Zuckerman kind of playfully marks the end of the book with, with circumcision, again, a very sort of Jewish, Jewish act. But the questions he's asking about identity um, and, uh, and again, the questions he's asking about fiction writing, I think, are, are, are kind of broader, more uni universal questions. Those are the questions that I think can, can resonate. Um, so the, the Jewish questions, the questions of Jewish identity, I think are filtered through a sort of larger concern about uh, how we imagine ourselves. Um, and that sense that we're all sort of play acting, that it kind of who we are depends on where we are. Again, the book's insistence on, on organization by place, I think is really important that our sense of self can change where we are. It's not until uh, you know Zuckerman gets to England that he feels his most at his most Jewish. And I think that 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 seems 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 important. Um, uh, but the, the, the sort of questions of identity and also of, of writing fiction too. Um, I, I think one of the more overlooked aspects of the novel is that section where after Zuckerman's death, where Zuckerman actually has written his own eulogy, um, and uh, Henry discovers this manuscript. Uh, and just, just decides to destroy it after he vomits on the side of, uh, of, of, of the road. The sense of, 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 well, what is the ethics of transforming one's life and uh, your family members' lives into fiction? Those are also, I think, questions that, that resonate for a non-Jewish non readership. Next from Amy. Hi, Amy. Thank you for joining us. Um, Amy says, thank you for your wonderful remarks, Matthew. I've been thinking about what you said about how Roth uses both realism and experimental writing. I was wondering if you could say more about what is happening in American literature in the 1980s. Nadine said you work on Updike. That would make that tension so interesting. It also suggests realism is an experimental and the experimental can't get at the truth. Is this something Roth and maybe Updike and others are challenging? Listening to you speak now, I realize this may be redundant. You meant just mentioned Kundera, which helps me. Yeah, no, um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Roth was always kind of careful not to identify himself as, as the sort of coming from the sort of postmodern writers, I'm thinking of John Barth, um, uh, Donald Bar Bartolome, or Robert Coover, um, uh, that really kind of emerged in the in Thomas Pynchon in the in the '60s and in the 1970s. And there's a sense I think that Roth um, is interested in what realism can do, uh, but also interested in what the form of the novel can do too. So um, I, I think he sees both as ways. I think he. Th He's interested in how you can integrate the two to best get at not the truth, perhaps, but a more uh, kind of more accurate way of 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 capturing the contradictory nature of existence. I think for Roth, our, our sense of the world is is inherently strife-filled and, and contradictory, and so what kind of narrative form can capture that sense of of conflict uh, alongside with also capturing that, that, that sense of the, the world that, that gives it a sort of emotional resonance. And so I think Roth's solution to this question in the counterlife is that sort of combination of the two. We feel him do it again, though. I mean, um, I mean, we've seen him do it at earlier books, too. I mean, The Ghost Rider, that section where Nathan imagines the sort of counter existence of, of, of uh, uh, Anne, Anne Frank, in many ways, is a micro version of what we get in, in, in the counter life. What happens when we just sort of imagine, start imagining things? In terms of the relationship between Updike and Roth, I, um, I mean, Updike himself, I think, uh, um, on the one hand, I think he's a writer more known for that sort of realism in the Rabbit novels. That I mean, it is sort of a very, I mean, it's a very particular brand of, of realism. I think it's a, there, there's sort of a micro attention to things in Updike that that distinguishes his sense of things. But Updike himself at this time is experimenting, and um, uh, I'm not sure how how familiar our, our listeners are with um, some of his mid career books. But he takes on Nabokov as his chief sort of literary uh, inspiration in, in around the mid '70s, and a books called like Month of Sundays, uh, The Coup, which is set in an imaginary African land. Uh, which is for each week, which was turned into sort of a weird, strange movie, uh, and uh, Roger's version, which comes out in the same year as as, as the Counter Life. All those books uh, are not sort of traditional realism at all. Uh, in many ways, they're as experimental as anything in the Counter Life, um, but just going at it through a different sort of lens, coming at it through Nabokov more than say Kundera. So I think there's the, they're both writers at the same time 
Roth and Updike who are experimenting, um, but I think they're they're coming at it from slightly different sort of angles. They're um, they're they're widening their um, uh, tool tool chest um, in terms of the things that they can use use as writers at about the same time, which I think is interesting. Um, I see Judy has her hand raised. Judy, I'll get to you after the next two uh, Q and A questions um, from Carolyn. In the Christendom chapter, when we are introduced to Maria's family history, we learn that her father's second wife is referred to only as "keep death off the road." Zuckerman mentions that this is meant to be witty, but impenetrably British in why it's witty. Do you have an idea what the phrase refers to? Oh goodness! I think you've stumped me. I forgot about that line. No, I don't. Um, I don't have a sense of what that what that refers to. That's a great question. I mean, th that section is so wonderful for that just that sense of um, alienation that Zuckerman feels while in England. I think, um, uh, and that sense of if Zuckerman has always been someone to uh, reject that sense of, of Jewish identity, he, he just fully embraces being Jewish in in, in England, and it's that sense of things both being impenetrable and hostile at the same time, all right? This sort of notion of wonderful pastoral life, wonderful married, married life that he, he just can't, can't accept. Uh, but I, I don't have a good answer to that, to that question. I have to, I have to look into that. Uh, next from Wendy, would you talk about Bellow's influence on Roth? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, Bellow is a sort of wonderfully huge influence for Roth, um, especially in terms of the voice of the novel, I think, um, and all that the, that voice can do. I think Bello, if there's a sort of sense of where we feel Bellow most is in that sort of liberatory voice that Roth is able to embrace uh, really after an uh, uh, important noise complaint. Um, so uh, the, and that sort of expansiveness, I think, um, uh, uh, that sort of, uh, you know, uh, that sort of engagement with the larger world, with larger history, with larger sort of questions. I, I think that's where you begin to feel Bellow and Roth. Um, and The Counter Life becomes one of those books where you can feel that maybe more, more pronounced. Again, I think it's a book where Roth really um, expands the sort of questions he's interested in and what he can do with fiction. Uh, and in that sense, that that can be traced back, back to Bellow. Um, you feel Bello too. Bello appears as a character in the, in the Counter Life, or a version of um, uh, of, of Bello, um, in that uh, writer that the young Zuckerman encounters. Um, I forget what he calls Bello in that book, but they, they, he's playing with Bello a little bit in, in that. In, in, in that, but I think for me, Bello's influence is mostly in that sense of um, of, of, of a freedom that I think Roth got while reading uh, Augie March. Um, that sort of sense of what. Uh, what you can embrace your own sort of voice, and, and then real, Roth's really able to do that, starting with um, with Portnoy's complaint. Once he sort of breaks free from what he called the sort of graduate school voice of Henry James, um, and uh, that sense of trying to be a, a you know fully serious serious writer, I think Bella helps helps him in, in that sense. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Judy, uh, usually we, we type our questions into the chat. I'm going to let you speak. So uh, go ahead, Judy. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. OK, while Judy's waiting to unmute herself, do we have any other comments or questions about the counter life? Okay, while, while we're all, all still thinking, uh, I do want to note that our next book club will take place on September 10th. Uh, Ms. Amy Pazorski, who is joining us here today, Professor of English at Central Connecticut State University and co-executive editor of Philip Roth Studies and former president of the Philip Roth Society, will be leading a discussion about American pastoral. And also stay tuned, we're working on a program all about uh, the Wequaic neighborhood of Newark. So about its history, and then we'll have an opportunity for people to share their memories about growing up in Wequaic or if they knew Philip Ross. So just keep that in mind. Okay, uh, great. Another question from Barry. Any idea how Israelis react to this book and Roth in general? 
Thanks. Uh, a great question. Uh, Ross reputation in, in Israel, I think, has, has been fairly, fairly strong. I, I don't have a sense of what the particular reaction was or the contemporary reaction in 86 was when Roth publishes this book uh, in Israel. I get, uh, get the sense that, sense that um, Operation Shylock, which I don't know if, you, if, you, if you've read, it, it comes out um, in, I think, 92 or 93. Uh, 90, or 94, sorry, early 90s. Um, and it's set largely in Israel with an a kind of imposter, Philip Roth, um, trying to lead the Jews out of Israel. That book got a much stronger reaction, I think, in, in, in Israel. Uh, and it really becomes Roth's most uh, deepest engagement with, with Israel. Um, um, uh, the the counterlife, I think, I think there was a sense that Roth was finally sort of entering the sort of questions that he should have been dealing with, if that makes sense from from that from from an uh, Israeli sort of perspective. But I don't get a sense that the book, um, what the book's exact reaction was um, uh, in, in the you know mid to late '80s when it was published in Israel. But I do get the sense that Roth's uh, reputation um, um, kind of grew uh, uh, in Israel uh, over the second part of his career. Um, more general question from Kate. Uh, what what is your take on the noble skip for Roth? Yeah. Oh, I know. Um, I, I I mean, I think that's just it was it was you know uh, incredibly sad. Uh, no, um, uh, I mean, I think the Nobel Committee uh, has had a chance to recognize a number of American writers: um, Roth, uh, uh, Updike. Even Delillo or Pynchon, all you know, all writers who I think are uh, you know um, uh, deeply deserving of a Nobel Prize, uh, um, and uh, there was a sort of uh, you get a sense of sort of anti-American sentiment among the sort of uh, Nobel Nobel Committee. I mean, when they gave it to Dylan, and I'm a huge Dylan fan, um, um, but when they gave it to Dylan, that seemed to be a sort of signal that they weren't weren't going to give it to Roth. Um, that they weren't inclined to give it given it to give it to an American. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I think as this sort of the the, the national international politics of that uh, uh, more more at play. Um, um, I mean, you always had questions with Roth, Roth and questions that, of course, is in with Updike, too, in terms of treatment of women in, in the fiction. And for Roth, in particular, sort of, uh, is he a writer who circles around the same sort of questions? Um, uh, but I think those, but uh, it, it does seem unfortunate that Roth never, never got, never got the prize or any of these, uh, you know, any of those Americans of that generation, um, who, again, I think had a, have a body of work that uh, justifies that, justifies that merit, weren't, weren't recognized. That said, I'll still spend my Dylan records. I like Dylan, so. Um, uh, from Amy, regarding the noble skip, one of the judges said American writers seemed too provincial and many thought that referred to Roth. But Matthew's remarks today suggests Roth's, Roth is such a global and world interested writer, no? Yeah, I mean, I, that, 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 the charge of provincialism, I remember when that was, when that, they said that it always seemed to me absurd with with Roth, um, um, uh, especially in the second half of his career. I mean, starting as early as the Professor of Desire, which is 1977, you have that section devo devoted in uh, in, in, in Prague. Uh, Roth is turning his lens outward. I mean, um, and so not only do you have more international settings in Roth's fiction in the second half of the career, uh, but the sort of sense of questions he's asking are, I think, are anything but provincial. And the counter life is maybe the best example of that. These are these are large existential uh, historical questions Roth, Roth is dealing with. Um, uh, uh, so the sort of notion that Roth is somehow a narrow, narrow writer uh, or a limited writer seems to me um, misguided, so. We've got about 10 more minutes for questions. So please don't be shy, ask another question. Uh, we, we love hearing about the counter life and what Matthew's uh, thoughts and insight uh, might be. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, I uh, also wanna note that uh, in November, we'll be having our um, annual uh, Philip Roth lecture. So stay tuned for more information about that. And we've got lots of exciting plans for March of next year. So uh, the Philip Roth Society will be hosting a, a conference at the library in March. 
And then following that, there will be additional festivities which are still being planned in Newark. So, um, you know, if you live far away or even if you live close by, um, keep your calendars open for all kinds of exciting things that will be happening. Um, uh, from Jim, could you say something about the role of minor characters like Mordecai Lipman or Jimmy Lustig? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and Jimmy is such a wonder wonderful character. Both of those are sort of wonderful, wonderful characters. Um, um, uh, I mean, it's Roth's sort of interest in radical reinventions and radical positions, uh, especially with, with Mordecai and that sort of sense of, uh, I mean, it's Roth really sort of taking on, um, uh, you know, how one gets a position, a more radical position on, on, on uh, or with, with at least Nathan Zuckerman sees this sort of more radical position on, on what it means to be a Jew or what it means to be living in Israel. Uh, Jimmy is a sort of wonderfully bizarre character that I think for Roth uh, lets him sort of introduces the novel's real sense of play. I mean, Jimmy at the wall, um, uh, the, the sort of the baseball, the baseball aspect of that, and then showing up on the airplane um, with the sort of, um, you know, threat of almost comic terrorism. Um, it, it, for Ra it is a sort of wonderful moment of, of, of what's in a sense not real in a sense, or what's imaginary. It's this sense of the unexpected um, that I think Lippmann really sort of nice, nicely captures. Uh, and it's that moment in the novel too. I mean, if you weren't jarred enough uh, by the first two sections, I think, um, um, and that reversal from, uh, from um, from from Henry being dead to Henry being alive in Israel, then that section from section two to section three, a, lo a loft where it, you know it, it's a place but not a place, right? Being up being up in the air, it's that sense of everything is in flux. And I think Lipman, uh, sorry, Jimmy is that sort of wonderful sort of uh, embodiment of, of 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 the imaginary of the sort of unexpected kind of coming in coming into. So he embodies that sense of sense of kind of. Yeah, play is a little darker than play, but that sense of play that I think Roth is interested in too. And it also becomes a sort of key moment, again, um, to, to, for, you know, shaking us as readers that we're not reading a sort of typical Roth novel, that, 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 that he's really playing with things within, within it. Um, uh, so yeah, I hope that answered, answered that question. I think Roger had the same question. So Roger's question was, what is the function of the crazy character from West Orange, who was a baseball player yeah. at the Wailing Wall and then shows up as an airplane hijacker? And I mean, I should stress that uh, I've taught the counter life uh, a, a few times. Um, I usually teach it in a, a, a sort of mid-level course called Art, Art of the Novel. Uh, uh, and I do that because it is, uh, I think Roth's most narrative is, is narrative ex experimental experimental work um but again it's accessible in its own way once you start to get into it and get into the sense of reversal and that sense of uh, the rug getting pulled out from you as roth describes in that interview i think it's a book that you can deeply enjoy but you can kind of hurt your brain trying to figure out what's actually real what the true story is right even this sort of notion that what we could be reading in the final section of the book is Zuckerman's manuscript that he was working on before he died. I, I, that sense of well, what is actually real here? What is the nature of the book that we're that we're reading? Um, uh, um, you know, is Zuckerman really dead when he's dead and and, and it dies in, in section section four? Right. Um, those sort of uh, narrative questions make it a really difficult book. Um, uh, uh, you know, most Roth, I think you can. Um, read, kind of read on your own in a sense and navigate more freely, um, you know, poor noise complaint, even American Pastoral, which has some narrative experiments going on too. Uh, but the counter life really is, is, is jarring on this first, first reading. Um, uh, and uh, that sense that sense that we as readers, when we're approaching any novel, want to read what, what, what actually happened, what's the true story, right? That, that Roth is is, is purposely sort of frustrating us as readers in the counter life by not giving us that sort of uh, narrative narrative satisfaction. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew, for leading this discussion of the counter life and thank you for everybody um, who's attending. Um,
And thank you to you, Eric, for his technical support today. This meeting has been recorded and is now going to be available on the library's New York Public Library's Facebook page and should be available on our YouTube page sometime later. Thank you again for joining us on this Saturday. Again, the next book club will be on September 10th. And after that, we will have one last one for the year in November, and that one will be on patrimony. Again, 